Hello everyone. Welcome to Lit Audio Hub. Let's start this video. What are the easiest ways to be happy? We feel that to be happy, there should be certain circumstances only then we can be happy. We will tell you 10 lessons with the help of which you can be happy. Whatever we do in life, we do it to get happiness. But unfortunately, being happy seems to be a very difficult task. We feel that to be happy, there should be certain circumstances. Only then, we can be happy. But this is not so. We are telling you some easy tips by adopting which you can be happy in every situation. When you are basically happy, when you do not have to do anything to be happy, then every aspect of your life will change. There will be a change in your experiences and the way of expressing yourself. You will feel the whole world has changed. You will no longer have any vested interest because whether you do or don't do something, whether you get or don't get something, whether something happens or not, you will be joyful by nature. When you are naturally happy, whatever you do will be on a totally different star. So the first lesson is to remember that being happy is your basic responsibility. The first and foremost responsibility of a human being is to be a happy being. Being happy is not the ultimate aspect of life. It is the basic aspect of life. If you are not happy, what can you do in your life? Once you are happy, then only other great possibilities open up. Whatever you do, you are expanding and awakening your inner guna. Whether you like it or not, this is the reality. Unless something important happens within you, you cannot do anything very important for the world. So if you are worried about the world, the first thing you should do is to transform yourself into a happy being. The second lesson is to recognize that happiness is your basic nature. It does not matter what you are doing in your life, whether it is business, power, education, or service, you are doing it because somewhere deep inside you there is a feeling that it will make you happy. Everything we do on this earth is done with the desire to be happy, because that is our basic nature. When you were a child, you were happy by default. That is your nature. The source of happiness is within you. You can make it a living experience forever. The third lesson is to recognize the importance of things. This morning did you notice that the sun is rising wonderfully, the flowers are blooming, no star has fallen, the constellations are working very well, everything is in order, the whole universe is working very well today, but a worm of a thought in your mind forces you to believe that today is a big day. Suffering occurs mainly because most humans have a wrong attitude towards this life. Their psychological story has become bigger than the story of existence, or to put it simply, you have made your creation more important than the story of the best creation. This is the basic source of all suffering. We have come to a complete understanding of what is the importance of being alive here. A thought in your mind, or a feeling in your mind, dictates the nature of your experience at the moment. And it may also be that your thought or feeling has nothing to do with the limited reality of your life. The whole universe is happening very well. But just one thought or feeling can destroy everything. The fourth lesson is to see your mind or brain as it is. What you call my mother is not yours in the world. You do not have a mother of your own. Please pay attention to this. What you call my mother is just the garbage bin of society. Anyone and everyone who passes by, you put something or the other in your mind. You cannot really choose from whom you will receive things and whom you will not receive. If you say, I do not like this person, you will receive from that person more than from anybody else. You have no choice. This garbage bin can be useful if you know how to correct it and use it. This pile of influences and information that you have accumulated is useful only for surviving in the world. It has nothing to do with who you are. Fifth lesson. Move from mind to your basic being. When we talk of any spiritual process, we talk of moving from mind to your basic being. Life is about this universe which is here. To know it completely and experience it in its true form and not to distort it according to your own will is life. If you want to move towards the reality of existence, then in simple words, you just have to keep in mind that what you think is not important, 
What you feel is not important. What you think has nothing to do with reality. It has no great importance for life, i.e., you are just entangled in those useless things which you have collected from somewhere else. If that is what you find important, you will never be able to see beyond it. Your attention naturally goes in the direction of what you find important. If your thoughts and your feelings are us to you, then naturally all your attention will be there. But this is just a psychological fact. It has nothing to do with what exists. Suffering is not showered upon us. It is created, and the factory that creates it is in your mind. Now is the time to shut down this factory. Sixth lesson. Don't try to have everything. Start expressing. Today we are so desperately searching for happiness that life on earth is in danger. Don't keep searching for happiness. Learn to express your joy in the world. If you look back at your life, the most beautiful moments of your life were when you were expressing your joy, not when you were looking for it. What you save will never be your joy. What you flatten, what you scatter will be your joy. If you keep your joy childishly, at the end of life, no one will be the same. He saved every bit of joy in himself. He died with great joy. They will say this horrible creature never smiled in his life. But if you spread your joy and love every day, people will say, hey, he was a happy and loving person. Seventh, seek Pont, and smile in happiness and sorrow. The first thing you should do when you wake up in the morning is to smile. At whom? Not at someone. Because in your place, this is no small thing. Millions of people who slept last night did not wake up today, but you and I woke up. Isn't it a great thing that you are the same? So smile when you wake up. After that, look around, and if there is someone, smile at them. It happened to many people that their loved ones were not there this morning. All the people you love were there. Wow, it's a great day, isn't it? Then go outside and look at the trees. They too were not destroyed last night. Many people may find this strange, but you will realize its importance when your loved ones don't wake up in the morning. Don't wait till then to realize its importance. It is not funny or laughable. The most valuable thing is that you are alive, and whoever cares for you is alive. On this unfortunate night when so many people did not wake up, and so many people's loved ones did not wake up, you and your loved ones were able to wake up. Isn't that a wonderful thing? Understand its importance, and at least smile. Learn to look at some people with love. Eighth lesson, remind yourself, it takes only an hour for many people to forget all this, and soon, their reptilian brain is eager to bite someone. So give yourself a dose every hour. Remind yourself of the importance of life. If you are very numb, remind yourself every half an hour. If you are extremely numb, remind yourself every five minutes. It takes only ten seconds to remind yourself. You can do it in just two seconds. I am alive. You are alive. What else do you need? Navi Sika. Change what is inside you. The quality of your life at present is not determined by the clothes you wear. It is not determined by your educational qualifications, your family status, or your bank balance. The quality of your life depends on how peaceful and happy you are within yourself. Certainly, a person who does not get bhajans and lacks the basic things needed to survive will be in a lot of physical pain. This needs to be taken care of. For such people, we have to arrange for those basic things. But for the rest, their needs are an endless list. Do you think the man driving a car is happier than the man walking on the road? No, it does not depend on what you have. It depends on how they are feeling at the time, the picture, and the final lesson. Stop comparing yourself to others. Most people are not unhappy because they lack something. They are unhappy because they compare themselves to others. You are riding a motorbike. You see someone driving a Mercedes and you make yourself unhappy. A person riding a bicycle sees you on a motorbike and it is a limousine for him. A person walking on foot looks at a cycle and thinks, Oh, if only I had this cycle, I would do so much with my life. This is a stupid game that continues. People who depend on external circumstances to be happy will never be able to experience true happiness in their lives. 
Surely now is the time to look inside ourselves and see how we can live in happiness. From your own experience of life, you can clearly see that true happiness is only attained when there is a change in your inner self. When you depend on external circumstances to be happy, you must understand that external circumstances are never 100% favorable to you. When this is the reality, at least this one person, that is you, should live the way you want to live. If you are the way you want to be inside yourself, then you will be naturally happy. It is not something that you have to search for. If you go back to your original nature, then you will simply be happy. Our second story is how to control your mind. Today, we will tell you 10 tips to control your mind. If you follow, then you will definitely be able to control your mind. So friends, let us explain you one by one. 10 tips to control your mind. We often have so many thoughts in our mind throughout the day that it becomes difficult to feel that we are able to control them completely. Sometimes it seems that they have dominated your mind. You are lying in bed after a day that never seems to end. Your body is tired and your pillows are calling you, but as soon as you lie down on the bed, your mind goes crazy. These thoughts come to your mind suddenly, and you do not know what to do about them. Suddenly, you feel stressed out, and you feel like you will never be able to sleep. Then you will know that you need to learn to control your mind. You can learn how to change those unwanted negative thoughts to more positive thoughts. It won't happen at the snap of your fingers, but with constant effort, you will be able to focus your thoughts on more productive, positive things. Let's find out why it is important to control your thoughts and how our thoughts are connected to the rest of our body. What are unwanted thoughts? We know that positive thinking and optimism can really improve our health and physical well-being, but unwanted thoughts can fill us with negative emotions and make us feel defeated. They take us away from the present moment by making us tangled up in the past or feeling anxious about the future. Along with unwanted thoughts, we may struggle with negative self-talk as we feel less confident, have more self-doubt, and have lower self-esteem. Sometimes these negative thoughts can seem spontaneous. Perhaps something reminded you of a friend you lost or an opportunity you missed. At that time, your unwanted thoughts can harm your work or prevent you from doing something new, and if you are struggling with your mental health, it can be even worse. Research has shown that depression leads to more negative thoughts, which makes it harder to control your thoughts. If we do not make an effort to gain control over our thoughts, our unwanted thoughts can negatively impact our overall health. If you think you are the only one struggling with unwanted thoughts, you are not alone. At Butter Up, our coaches provide support and guidance as you work towards building healthy health. Learning to take control of your mind away from unwanted thoughts is not easy. It requires hard work and a lot of focus. Some days your unwanted thoughts can overwhelm you. But the important thing is to avoid this thought. Can you control your mind? Because you definitely can. Practice mindfulness, meditation, and breathing exercises. Replace insults with positive affirmations in your self-talk. Take breaks during the day to calm your mind. Avoid things that trigger negative thoughts, such as scrolling through social media. If you are confused or unsure how to think, develop better self-awareness to identify patterns that are causing unwanted thoughts, such as rumination or a bad attitude. Try to challenge your inner critic and become more positive by changing your approach to situations. Make sure you give your mind a proper rest after exercising or a stressful day. Write down your thoughts in a diary and get them out and express your feelings. Seek help from a therapist, life coach, or a trusted friend or loved one. Learn that it is okay to accept your thoughts, but let go of thoughts that do not serve your purpose. Stop listening to negative pessimists and ignore their advice. Practice positive visualization when you are overwhelmed by unwanted thoughts. Distract yourself, whether it's calling a friend, watching a show, or going for a walk. Woman relaxing in a chair. How to control your mind. Why controlling your mind is important. Having control over your mind helps us achieve our short-term and long-term goals. 
It helps us go through our days professionally and personally with a clear, confident growth mindset. When our minds are under attack, it's hard to achieve our goals, especially when the attack comes from within us. These attacks can distract us, make us doubt ourselves, and derail our progress. But what you focus on affects your life. If you learn to let go of your negative thoughts, it will be easier for you to maintain a positive mindset. Try to focus your attention on avoiding negative thinking. With a more focused mindset that isn't bogged down by unwanted thoughts, we can achieve what we want to achieve. Sometimes we have to distract our minds from thoughts that seem positive, but it can actually lead us to something negative or upsetting. It is important to be realistic about our surroundings and be a healthy optimist. Being too positive, to the point where it becomes toxic, is not good for our minds either. It is just as important to recognize and control it. As much as managing your unwanted thoughts, what are the benefits of controlling your mind? Having control over your thoughts brings you many different benefits that affect every aspect of your life. Our human brain is hardwired to work both professionally and personally, so the benefits of controlling your mind are far-reaching. Being able to regulate our emotions in a healthy way helps us control our actions. We feel a wide range of emotions every day, and it is important to express them, but it is also important to learn to let go of control, and this will help us get rid of those distracting or unwanted thoughts. There are eight benefits to being in control of your mind. You know how to set boundaries in your relationships, because you know what you want and need. Your thoughts are more purposeful and meaningful. You can develop a healthier and happier life. You can overcome any challenge that comes your way in a creative and effective way. You have a greater insight into decision-making. You have a greater sense of self-awareness. You sleep better at night because you have a calmer mind. You are aware of your thoughts, whether they are positive or negative. We can feel mindful and in control in many situations. Having a good sense of time management at work isn't just because we use our calendars correctly. It's because we are mindful of our energy levels, thoughts, and feelings about our actions. Letting go of this control also helps us overcome the stress of burnout at work. We can't do everything. No matter how hard we try, if we're at the brink of anxiety or high stress, mindfulness can be helpful if we learn to control our mind. Mindful practice helps us manage and reduce our stress. Research has also found that mindfulness meditation and deep breathing help people overcome anxiety. Focusing on our mind can also help us be more intentional with our actions and behavior. The connection between mind, body, and emotions. We've talked a lot about our thoughts, but we can't forget that we need to be aware of our body state and emotions in order to control our mind. Because our mind, body, and emotions are all connected. So we have to think about our whole personality. A whole person approach to living means it's all about you. You are in the driver's seat, and you are detailing what you feel, how your body is doing, and what is going on in your mind. And each part is just as important as the next. When you are trying to learn to control your subconscious mind, and vice versa, you can't ignore how your physical body feels. Trying to create a balance between our mind, body, and spirit will help us stay healthy overall, and our personal and professional lives can't be considered opposites. If our personal life is healthy, but our career is taking a toll on us, our overall health is affected. To be successful in your career, it is also important that we sleep well at night, eat a balanced diet, and build social relationships. You can't change your life if you are neglecting one area because it seems unimportant. You are a whole person, and you must take care of your whole self. Remember you are the master of your mind as the whole person approach suggests. It is important to remind yourself that you are in control. No one else can tell you what you should or should not think, so it is up to you to decide what works. Sometimes it can be hard to challenge your unwanted thoughts and do the hard work needed to overcome them but being brave and dealing with negative thoughts now will make room for healthier, more positive thinking in the future. You decide what thoughts come to your mind and how you interact with them. Ask yourself in the future, 
Will you let your mind control you, or will you work towards learning to control your mind? Everyone has the right to feel that their mind is their own. It can provide you with the necessary support so that you can get rid of your unwanted thoughts and replace them with thoughts that help your well-being. So let's move on to our third and last story. We will explain this story to you through a story. So let's begin. A king had made his kingdom prosperous with his efforts. The kingdom was very happy because he worked keeping in mind the interests of every class. When the king grew old, he started worrying about a capable successor because he felt that without a capable successor, the order would turn into chaos and the problems of the people would increase. Although the king had a son, he was very lazy and lazy. He considered himself as his master and everyone else as his slaves. This arrogance was always reflected in his behavior. The king left him at Buddha's ashram with the aim of reforming him. The very next day, Buddha ordered the prince, Son, there is a forest five miles from here. You go there and bring some flower plants and plant them in the courtyard of the ashram. On hearing this, the prince became very angry because he had only learned to give orders because his father had asked Buddha to obey him. So he went to the forest against his wishes and brought flower plants and planted them in the ashram. The prince watered them and guarded them day and night to protect them from animals. In a few months, the entire ashram bloomed with beautiful flowers of bati bati. The prince was very curious to see the result of his hard work. Buddha praised him and explained to him, Son, remember that the one who is in power, his fortune also sleeps, and the one who is gone, his fortune always goes with him. Now the prince had become a hard-working person. The king had got his worthy successor. Work is the key to success. Hence, one should always be engaged in work. One day, an educated young man came to Buddha. He bowed to Buddha and expressed his curiosity. Guruji, you talk about God. Have you seen God that you can say so much on this subject of marriage? Buddha did not say anything and lovingly placed his hand on his head. The young man understood that Buddha did not have an answer to my question. Then he said, Come let us roam around in the garden here. There were fragrant flowers of rose and rajnaganda in the garden. The young man said, Guruji, the whole atmosphere is smelling with the fragrance of these flowers. Buddha said, Son, you are right. But tell me one thing. Can you see this fragrance? The young man said, No, fragrance is experienced. Then Buddha said, this is the answer to your question. Whenever there is an injury anywhere in your body, there is pain. Can you see this pain? The young man said, No, that is also an experience. Buddha finally resolved the young man's question by saying, The same thing happens with the soul and the supreme soul. The soul realizes God through feeling and not through physical eyes. The young man was now completely satisfied and left after thanking Buddha. God always happens on the star of feeling, and this happens when the mind has attained completeness, detached and possible. Mahatma Buddha used to live in his hut in solitude on the bank of a river. He had planted lush green trees around the hut. The chirping of birds kept resonating on them in the morning and evening. This sweet proximity of nature always kept Mahatma Buddha happy. It was as if the birds and trees had become his family. One day, Mahatma Buddha had just woken up in the morning and saw a Seth standing at the door. Seeing him worried, Mahatma Buddha asked him about his problem. Seth Ji said, Maharaj, I have a huge wealth, a whole family, and I do not have any disease. Still, I could not sleep. I keep turning from one side to another the whole night. Mahatma Buddha said affectionately on Seth Ji's head, Seth, you may have everything, but you do not have that which is necessary for sleep. Seth asked, What is that? Maharaj Mahatma said, You are surrounded by worries of wealth, business, trade, worry about family. Remember that worry is the enemy of choice. Seth asked the way to avoid it. Then he said, You should learn from nature. Her infinite wealth is scattered all around in the form of trees, plants, flowers, water, and light. But she is worry-free. Truth 
keeps showering this wealth of hers on the whole world with both hands. If you take inspiration from him and make your life similar to him, you will not only get sleep, but also feel great peace. The merchant understood the essence of Mahatma Buddha's words and started walking on the path of public welfare. Wealth and knowledge increase by giving, so along with their collection, one should also have the habit of donating them. A poor farmer was a great devotee of Gautam Buddha. One day he came to Buddha and requested him to come to his village. When Buddha reached his village, the whole village gathered to see and hear him. But the farmer did not come. It happened that on the same day the farmer's pair of oxen got lost somewhere. The farmer was in a dilemma whether to listen to Buddha's sermon or search for his oxen. After thinking a lot, he decided to search for his oxen. After wandering for hours, the oxen were found. The tired farmer came home and slept after having food. The next day he reached the forest Buddha with great hesitation and apology. Then he said with great affection, In my view, this farmer is my true follower. He gave more importance to action than preaching. If he had listened to the sermons without looking for the bulls, he would not have understood my words because his mind would have been stuck on the bulls. He did a praiseworthy work by giving importance to karma. Sir, wherever we are, we should perform our duties honestly. This is true spirituality because every religion gives utmost importance to karma. If Gautam Buddha's followers had loved him with love, he would have definitely gone. Then when Buddha would have reached, a huge crowd of listeners would have gathered. Everyone would have loved to drink the nectar element in Buddha's words. There was definitely something in his teachings that would solve serious problems and something meaningful would also be achieved. Sir, wherever we are, we should perform our duties honestly. This is true spirituality because every religion gives utmost importance to karma. When Purna reached, he slightly closed his eyes and asked Purna the reason for his coming. He said, I want to go for preaching religion. I need your permission. Buddha smiled and said that the path of Purna Dharma is very difficult. You will go to tell good things to people and people will get angry at you. It is possible that they may also abuse you. On this Purna said, It is okay. I will not pay attention to them thinking that they only abused me. Buddha said, It is possible that some people raise their hands. Purna said, then I will forgive them thinking that they did not attack me with scriptures. Buddha then said, It is possible that some people use scriptures on you. Purna replied, Then I will not have any feeling of retaliation towards them thinking that they hit me but did not kill me, left me alive. Buddha then said, And if they take your life? Purna immediately bowed his head and said, Then I will be grateful to them that they helped me to sacrifice my life on the path of religion. I will be grateful to them. Then Buddha opened his eyes and gave permission by blessing him and said to Purna, Now you are eligible to preach religion. The one who does not see any fault in anyone, he is the true one. It is very difficult to walk on the path of goodness. The one who walks on this path faces many obstacles. But the person who does not see faults in anyone is able to cross the obstacles easily and achieve his goal. Once when Gautam Buddha was passing through the forest, a demoness appeared with a sword in her hand and said, O oh Buddha, today your love will have to bow down to my hatred. Today is the last day of your life. Buddha replied smilingly, I will not bow down to hatred, ridicule, and malice. I am not affected by criticism, praise, or ridicule. You hate me so much but I love you too. The demoness asked, Why do you love me? Buddha said, I am seeing you as a mother, and a mother is a form of love. There can be no violence in her. On hearing this, the sword fell from the demon's hand. Buddha, you are blessed. On saying this, she transformed into a goddess and disappeared. Actually, those who hate others, hatred destroys them one day. Hatred drowns those who have fallen in hatred one day. Love is covered by the veil of truth. A person connected to truth always lives in happiness. Do not limit truth to yourself only. You have to put it in your deeds. 
Truth is the fragrance of the rose. Do your deeds by immersing them in love and truth. Love and truth take man towards development. Remember that both these paths lead to God. Those who walk on this path easily get happiness and peace. Gautam Buddha reached the forest resort of Vaishali city while traveling. The news of his arrival spread in the whole city. In no time, it seemed as if the whole city thronged to see him. Big businessmen, educationists, social workers, officers and many seniors associated with the royal family also reached there. Everyone felt that Tathagata Buddha reached their residence along with his disciples and accepted the invitation for the feast. Buddha was listening to everyone's request and expressed gratitude for the invitation with a natural smile. They were doing this. Just then, Amrapali, a courtesan from Vaishali, also reached there. Inspired by Buddha's teachings, she had given up her prostitute's profession long ago. She also invited Buddha to offer prayers. Buddha immediately accepted it and agreed to come to her house the next day, along with the monks. One of Buddha's disciples did not like the fact that despite so many requests from relatives, Buddha accepted Amrapali's invitation. In the disciples' view, Amrapali was associated with disgusting deeds because she was a courtesan. When everyone left, the disciple asked, Lord, so many people invited you, then why did you accept only Amrapali's invitation? Buddha said, I agree that she was a courtesan, but she has become pure by doing penance in the fire of repentance. If a person attains this purity, he becomes even better than those who are not involved in such disgusting deeds. One should not hesitate to accept the invitation of such a person. As long as a person is involved in bad deeds, it is fine to keep a distance from him. But one who leaves bad deeds, one should not hesitate to accept him. This strengthens his spirit of moving towards goodness. There is an incident from Gautam Buddha's life. He had made a rule that he would not give place to women in his Sangha. He had forbidden women from taking initiation as bhikshus. Once Gautam Buddha was staying in a village. There Mahaprajapati Gautami reached him. She told Buddha that you should also initiate women. But Buddha refused. Many women gathered and thought about how to get approval from Gautam Buddha. The women decided to go to Gautam Buddha as volunteers. Gautami cut her hair, wore monks' clothes and went to Buddha with many women. Their demand was that women should also be initiated. Buddha did not accept their demand. The women were disappointed. When Anand, one of Buddha's disciples, saw the women, their feet were swollen, dusty and tears were flowing from their eyes. He asked, What is the matter? The women said that according to their religion and rules, Buddha is not initiating us to become monks. When Anand personally requested Buddha, he reminded Buddha that at present there is a social belief that women are not entitled to salvation. They are inferior to men. So do you also believe this, and that is why you are not initiating them? Buddha's answer was, Do not misunderstand me. I believe that women can also attain nirvana just like men. But I am not giving permission to women to join the Sangha and give them initiation due to some practical reasons. Anand's answer was, There should be a change in theory and practice. Buddha liked the idea, and he announced that women who want to become monks will have to follow some rules. Women accepted, and from then on, women also started becoming Buddhists. Once Gautam Buddha went on a journey with his disciples. On their way from one city to another, there was a forest. As soon as they entered the forest area, after walking some distance, Buddha stopped at one place. The group of disciples coming behind also stopped at the same place after seeing him. But it became difficult for the disciples to stay there, because a mutilated corpse was lying in front and its stench was spreading in the atmosphere. The disciples closed their noses with their clothes, but Buddha kept staring at the corpse. A disciple gathered courage and humbly requested Gautam Buddha, Lord, it would be better to leave from here soon. There is a lot of ash lying here, and a very bad smell is coming. Buddha smiled, and turning towards the disciples said, Tell me, can you see beauty in all this? The disciples said, Lord, what kind of question is this? 
There was beauty in ash, and life was there in ash, but now all the beauty is gone. Buddha pointed towards ash and said, Look, whenever this person would have been alive, his teeth must have been unique. Even after death, looking at his teeth proves this. All the disciples standing there looked. Then they found that Buddha was right. Then the disciples realized that there can be goodness even in a dead body. Actually, beauty can be seen even in a non-living thing. The only condition is that the vision should be such that it can see goodness even in evil, like Buddha. A branch of a rose has more thorns than flowers. But we pick flowers, not thorns. In the same way, one should see goodness in someone and not a hundred evils. Once a very large group of Buddhist monks came to ancient Sialkot. This group was worried about a Brahmin who studied Vedas and was so orthodox that he did not allow even the shadow of any illegal pandit to fall on him. A monk took the initiative to reform him. The next day, he reached the Brahmin's house with his alms card and asked if he could provide some food and water. Hearing his words, all the people of the house remained silent and looked at him with disgust. The monk came back and went again the next day and repeated the same question. This time also he had to face silence and contempt. He was satisfied. One day when he reached the Brahmin's house, the Brahmin was not there. The Brahmin's mother was moved by the daily visits. She said, I will give you food and water, but I am helpless due to the anger of the Panditji. The monk said, It doesn't matter, sister. I do my work, you do your work. On his way back, the monk met the Brahmin. He scolded the monk a lot. Then the monk said, I have not received anything from your house till now, but today your wife has not given anything. Now someday, I will get a yes too. The Brahmin calmed down a bit and said, How long will you continue this work? The monk replied, As long as I am alive. Seeing his patience, the Brahmin's ego melted and he apologized to the monk. Actually, with the power of patience and tolerance, even the biggest adversity can be turned into an advantage. A person used to come regularly to listen to Lord Buddha's discourses. In this way, he had become a monk, but it did not affect his life. Lord Buddha used to say in his sermons that, Follow the religion, remove hatred from your life, always stay away from anger, greed, and ego. People got a lot of peace from Buddha's teachings, but that person was very restless. One day he went to Buddha and said, Lord, I have been listening to your teachings for a long time, but it has not had any effect on my behavior. I am very troubled. What should I do? Buddha listened to him and said, Where do you live? He said, Shravasti. Buddha asked the next question, How far is it from here? He told by estimation. Buddha again expressed curiosity. How much time does it take? The person calculated and told. Buddha asked, Now tell me, can you reach your home just by sitting here? He said, How is this possible? To reach there, you will have to walk. Then Buddha explained to him with great love, Just as one can reach only by walking, similarly, only by following the right path, one can benefit. Love, combine your actions with my knowledge, then you will get the best result. That person understood his mistake and improved his life, due to which his life became virtuous. There was a small river. On both its banks, people lived. People on both sides of the river used to carry out their work and live a happy life with the help of the river water. Once, there was a dispute between the two animals regarding water. They were blaming each other for taking more water. When the issue was not resolved through mutual talks, they resorted to fighting with whatever weapons they had. They immediately took them out and were ready to attack each other. Then someone went and informed Lord Buddha. He called the representatives of both the animals and asked the reason for the quarrel. Both the representatives put forth their side. Buddha listened to both and said smilingly, So what will you people do? Both the representatives said in anger, We will make rivers of blood. Lord Buddha said, So you want blood. They looked at Buddha with folded hands and then said, No, we want water. 
Lord Buddha said, So you want blood? They looked at Buddha with folded hands, and then said, No, we want water. Then Buddha said with ease, By shedding blood, we will get blood. How will you get water? After pausing a bit, Buddha said, Remember, violence has to increase. Violence increases. Learn from the river that it does not fight with anyone. It donates its water to everyone without any hesitation. Buddha's words worked like magic, and the problem of both the animals was solved easily. Both the parties started using water by sharing it. Yesterday, Buddha was giving a sermon in Vaishali. A huge crowd was listening to him with utmost peace and concentration. There was no noise. The voice of Mantra Buddha was resonating. People present along with Buddha's disciples were drinking the nectar words of Buddha with full concentration. Then a loud voice of a person disturbed the peaceful atmosphere. Why was I not allowed to sit in the assembly today? Buddha remained silent even after hearing the shouts of that person. That person shouted again and asked the same question. Buddha closed his eyes, and one of his disciples spoke up. Lord, please allow your disciple standing outside to come inside. Buddha opened his eyes and said no. He was surprised to hear the word untouchable, and asked, Why is he untouchable? Lord, in your religion there is no distinction of caste. Buddha said, Today he has become angry. The unity of life is broken by anger. An angry person commits mental violence. One who gets angry due to any reason is an untouchable. He should remember with some fear that non-violence is the supreme religion. The lesson of the story is that anger is an unspiritual emotion which is harmful for both the doer and the sufferer. To avoid this, we should adopt the habit of thinking and working peacefully. We should keep our mind and body calm. They are capable of taking sensible decisions. A monk of the Buddhist Sangha got a serious disease. His condition had worsened to such an extent that he could not even walk and was covered in feces and urine. Seeing his condition, even his fellow monks would not come near him and would turn their faces away in disgust and leave him. After some time, Buddha came to know about this, and he immediately went to the monk with his beloved disciple Anand. He was pained to see his pitiable condition. He asked the monk, What disease have you got? The monk said, Lord, I have a stomach ailment. Buddha lovingly stroked his head and asked, Is there no one to introduce you? On hearing the monk's no, Buddha said to Anand, Bring water. We will first clean his body. Anand brought water. Then Buddha poured water on the monk's body, and Anand cleaned his feces and urine thoroughly. After reaching there, Buddha patted the monk's head and Anand's feet in this way, and lifted him and laid him on the bed. Then Buddha gathered all the monks and explained to them, Monks, you have no mother, no father, no brother, no sister who will serve you. If you do not serve and take care of each other, then, then who will do it? Remember, he who serves the sick serves God. Compassion towards the sick, the feeling of service, is Buddha's biggest message to the world, which is relevant in every country and tomorrow. Gautam Siddhartha, after attaining enlightenment, went to the forest, Mahatma Buddha, the embodiment of truth, nonviolence, and kindness. Buddha reached a village with his disciples. Some ignorant people were against him. They started abusing Buddha. Buddha's disciples felt very big, but Buddha explained to them that these people are only abusing. Even if they were pelting stones, I would have said, let them do it, I know. These people want to say something, but due to anger, they are not saying anything. If these people had abused me ten years back, I would have abused them too, but now I have got freedom from giving and taking. Abusive words come out of anger. Here the house of anger has been destroyed long back. Those who abused have got into a big problem. Then Buddha asked his disciples that some people in this village are abusing. Tell them that the people from there had brought fruits and sweets here. Buddha asked, What did I do then? The disciples told that you returned all the fruits and sweets, saying that now the one who took them has left. Take them back. 
You had said that if you had come ten years back, I would have taken all the gifts. Buddha asked, Then what did those people do with the sweets? The disciples told that they must have distributed them in the village. Buddha said that those people distributed the sweets in the village, but I will tell those people not to abuse, son. Buddha then said that these people have prepared a place of abusive words, but they have come to the wrong person. They cannot make me angry, just like a peg, which does not make anyone angry. People hang clothes on it. Once all the villagers of Jai Tavan gathered to see Lord Buddha and listen to his sermons. At that time, enlightened people like Mahakashyaya, Mount Kalyan, Sariputra Chand and Devadatta were engrossed in a serious discussion on religion with Buddha. The villagers stood a little hesitantly because they were all feeling uncomfortable in the midst of so many learned people. After some fear, Buddha's gaze fell on these villagers. He immediately stopped the discussion on religion. He was surprised at this behavior of enlightened Buddha and looked at him with a questioning look. Buddha said to Anath Pindak, Sir, get up. A group of Brahmins is standing in front. Give them a seat and bring the things for the guests. When Anath Pindak looked back, he did not see the group of Brahmins. There is not a single Brahmin among them. All of them are of low caste. Many of them are pure. Buddha said seriously, Pindak, the person who is always devoted is a Brahmin. These people have come with feelings for a purpose, so at this time, they are Brahmins. You should respect them properly. The indication of the story is that a person is not born by birth, but by his deeds. One becomes a Brahmin who has good qualities and does good deeds, despite being born in a pure caste, is a Brahmin, and he should be respected in this form. If the balance of life is disturbed and fatigue comes, then understand that illness has come, and if one is taking rest to regain energy, then such fatigue can prove to be a boon as well. Our lifestyle is like both of these. There is a lot of imbalance in this. From getting up in the morning to sleeping at night, there are some regular activities of the body. Man has forgotten them. Gautam Buddha used to do very little but never got tired. Even today, Many sages and saints are working as hard as a successful person in the corporate world does, and when they sleep at night, they do it with complete carefreeness. Buddha's disciples once asked him, Don't you get tired? Buddha's answer was, When I don't do anything, how will I get tired? It sounds strange to hear, but it is very deep. Spirituality has called it Sakshi Bhav, witness feeling. Watching oneself while doing something is that state when the body is active and the body is in a relaxed posture. Today, most people go to work without any reason. One of the major reasons for this is unbalanced life. One is feeling tired and the other is natural tiredness. When your interests, desires and basic nature start getting irritable without any reason, understand that this tiredness is a disease. Therefore, do yoga, pranayam, and meditation daily. These activities are a relaxation in themselves. The one doing it is someone else. We are just puppets in his hands. This feeling will also remove tiredness. What is the problem in thinking like this? Mahatma Buddha was engaged in meditation for the glory of knowledge. He gave a lot of pain to his body, traveled, sang, did hard meditation in the forests, but did not get the glory of self-realization. Disappointed, Buddha started sleeping. I have not achieved anything yet. What will I be able to do now? These negative feelings of despair and faith purified him. After a few nights, he felt thirsty. He reached a lake situated at a distance. There he saw a scene that not one but two baby squirrels drowned in the lake. At first, the squirrel sat like a statue, then after some fear, got up and went near the lake dipped its head and body in the water of the lake, and then came out and started spitting water. It kept doing this repeatedly. Buddha started sleeping. How foolish is the effort of this squirrel? Will it ever be able to dry this lake? But the squirrel's effort continued continuously. Buddha felt as if the squirrel was thinking that I do not know whether this lake will ever be empty or not, but I will not give up my effort. Therefore, the small squirrel took the baby from Lord Buddha for deviating from its goal. 
He started sleeping when this small squirrel, determined to give dryness to the lake with its small strength. If it is there, then what is my lack? I have thousand times more capability than this. Thinking this Gautam Buddha completely immersed himself in his meditation, and one day he received the light of enlightenment under the Bodhi tree. This story gives strength to continue trying despite failure. If we do not stop trying, then one day the goal is definitely achieved. During his meditation, Buddha was sitting engrossed in meditation in a secluded place. Buddha was unaware of the fact that a yaksha lived at this place. He reached there, and seeing the peaceful environment, he got engrossed in meditation. At that time, the yaksha was not there. When it was night, he came back, and seeing an unknown person at that place, he became mad. He roared loudly, but Buddha's meditation was not broken. The yaksha tried to scare him by taking the form of an elephant, but Buddha remained engrossed in meditation. To scare Buddha, he gradually took the form of a lion, a cheetah, etc., but Buddha remained unperturbed. At last, he took the form of a terrible poison and bit the thumb of his wing, but even his poison had no effect on Buddha. He was still affected. The poisonous snake climbed on his body and hugged him and bit him hard, but despite so many efforts, it could not break Buddha's meditation. Takar came down and started relieving himself by lying down a few steps away from him. After completing the meditation, Buddha looked at him and caressed him with great affection. Seeing his unconditional love, the snake's poison turned into nectar and the yaksha with devotion he bowed down to the Buddha. The gist of the story is that mother's evil can be overcome with concentration, love, and determination. Buddhist monk Bodhidharma reached a village while traveling. People respected him a lot. The villagers welcomed Bodhidharma and his disciples heartily and then gathered around him to listen to his holy words. Bodhidharma started explaining good things about religion and conduct to people in simple language. Then a person came there and started abusing Bodhidharma. The people present there tried a lot to stop him, but he did not listen and kept on calling Bodhidharma very good. People said that Maharaj, this person is so impudent, he is unnecessarily abusing you. Bodhidharma did not get angry at that person's behavior and told the people that this is going to be my biggest devotion in future. People asked how. Bodhidharma replied that when someone goes to a Kumar's house to get a pot, then the stand is checked by ringing it to see if it is cracked or not. When someone can check a stand worth one or two rupees so well, then whoever has to do so much, how to recognize him as guru without abusing him. First he tested how much patience, anger, and ability the guru has. Only after knowing this, he will accept him as guru. Therefore, this person is not abusing me unnecessarily, and later on, that person actually became the biggest devotee of Bodhidharma. Before teaching someone, one's own conduct should also be good. Only then does one get the great position of a guru. In fact, a guru is accepted as a guru only when he always has all the characteristics of a guru. Sermons of Mahatma Gautam Buddha were going on in Shravasti. A large number of people used to come to the sermon every day and learn from Buddha on various important and serious topics. Buddha's disciple class was also very large, who used to manage the preaching place and were always ready to serve Buddha. Once Mahatma Buddha was giving a sermon at night. As always, many people were listening to his sermon. A person who was sitting right in front of Buddha was repeatedly feeling sleepy. Buddha kept preaching for a while and then said to him, Son, are you sleeping? The person said in a hurry, No. Mahatma Buddha started preaching again. That person started getting up again. The Mahatma again repeated the same question, and he again said, Today's cycle is not Mahatma. This happened about eight to ten times. After some fear, Buddha asked him, Son, are you alive? Like every time, this time also he said, no, Mahatma. On hearing this, a wave of laughter ran among the audience, and that person became fully conscious. Then Buddha became serious and said, Son, I got the right answer from your mouth in my sleep. 
the people who are in sleep are actually dead society. Mahatma Buddha's indication was that alertness is very important while receiving knowledge from the guru. In a state of negligence, the power of knowledge is not complete. The knowledge of a woman always proves to be dangerous. This story is from the end of Siddhartha's life when he had not attained Buddhahood. And Siddhartha used to meditate under a tree in the forests on the banks of the Niranjan River. After meditating every day, Siddhartha used to go to a nearby village and beg for alms. After some time, he stopped going for alms because Sujata, the younger daughter of a village headman, started bringing bhajans for him every day. She used to sing bhajans for Siddhartha with great affection. After some time, a shepherd of this village also got impressed by Siddhartha and started coming to him. His name was Swastik. One day, Siddhartha was talking to Swastik when Sujata brought bhajans. As soon as Siddhartha started singing bhajans, he stopped talking. He remained absolutely silent for as long as he sang bhajans, and there was silence. Swastik was surprised. After Siddhartha sang bhajans, he asked him, Gurudev, you kept talking continuously after my arrival, but did not speak a single word during the bhajans. What is the reason for this? Siddhartha said that bhajans are made with great difficulty. The farmer first sows the seeds, then he takes care of the plants, and then the grains are produced. Then the women of the house make them edible with great care. The full enjoyment of bhajans prepared with so much difficulty is possible only then. When we are completely silent during the bhajan, I remain silent and enjoy it completely. Bhajans done with great peace not only satisfy physical hunger, but also give mental joy and sattvic energy. Emperor Ashoka wanted to unite the whole of India in his kingdom, but he was deeply saddened to see the bloodshed in the Kalinga War. He felt ashamed of himself on seeing the devastation caused by his ambition. He saw that people were suffering from pain. All this destruction was caused only by his ambition. Seeing all this, Ashoka thought of leaving the lesson of destruction and following the path of righteousness. The place where Ashoka's capital was Pataliputra was known as Patna. Gaya is also not very far from Patna, where Mahatma Buddha attained enlightenment under the Bodhi tree. The message of the Eightfold Path of Peace of Buddha created such a turmoil in Ashoka's heart and mind that he decided to adopt that path. By following this path, he left an indelible mark in history. Ashoka sent his son to Ceylon, now Sri Lanka, and many other far-off places to make milk. A ruthless ambition turned into such a sacred purpose. There was a desire to do something good and spread the message of compassion and love all around. Compassion is not just a feeling of kindness, it creates a strong desire to help others in you. This feeling made Buddha great and Ashoka great. Tathagata Buddha was on a tour of Magad. Along with him, there was a large group of disciples. Buddha used to give sermons every day, and a large number of people used to come to take benefit of them. These people included common people as well as eminent personalities. However, Buddha used to have a social love and intimacy with everyone. Among these people was the son of the city merchant, who used to listen to Buddha's sermons very attentively. He used to praise Buddha in front of his disciples and used to go home with a feeling of gratitude. One day after the sermon was over, he expressed his heartfelt desire to meet Buddha by telling a disciple. When he was taken in front of Buddha, he prostrated before him and said, Lord, there has never been an ascetic and knowledgeable person like you before, and neither will there be in the future. On hearing this, Buddha interrupted him and said, Son, have you studied so much that how many saints and great men have been there till now, have happened, and have you also known the future, that there will be no one else in future? The young man stood silent in shame because he did not have any answer to this. While concluding his talk, Buddha taught him to always keep your eyes open, give importance to everyone as he is, do not compare him with anyone. The moral of the story is that it is right to freely praise an expert scholar of any field, but it is wrong to call him the best, because the best cannot be bound in the limits of a person, time, and place. 
Anand was the chief and beloved disciple of Lord Buddha. His nature had qualities like generosity, affection, and tolerance. He behaved socially towards everyone. In his eyes, there was no one small or big. Once Anand was going to Katha. On the way, they felt very thirsty. When they looked around, they saw a well nearby. They reached there. A girl was filling water from a cane. Anand went to her and said, Sister, I have been coming from a long distance. I am very thirsty. Please give me water to drink. On hearing this, the girl got up slightly because she belonged to the untouchable caste. She knew that giving water to a person of a higher caste was beyond her jurisdiction. She stood quietly with her eyes down. Anand, distraught with thirst, said again, Sister, didn't you hear? I am dying of thirst. Give me water to drink. The girl, unconscious, did not say anything. When Anand asked her affectionately the reason for not giving her water, she said, I am a girl of a lower caste. How can I give you water? Hearing her, Anand said, Sister, I have asked you for water, but I did not ask your caste. Anand's generosity made the girl's brother go away, and after giving them water, she became blessed. The gist of the story is that because God has equal vision, He has blessed all human beings with society, body, intellect, and emotions. Going against one's Creator, it is completely inappropriate to discriminate between human beings. Once, Lord Buddha told His disciples, all the people reached Pataliputra with Him. After staying in a vihar and doing bhajan, Buddha asked Anand to start preaching from the next day. Next day, a large number of people were present to listen to Buddha's sermon. After preaching, Buddha would meet people, listen to their problems, and give good advice. One day during the sermon, Buddha's disciple Anand asked him, There are thousands of people sitting in front of you. Tell me who is the happiest among them. Buddha cast a bird's eye view of the crowd and said, Look, there is a thin man sitting at the back wearing torn clothes. He is the happiest. Anand did not agree and said, How is this possible? He looks very pitiful. To prove his point, Buddha asked the people sitting in front one by one, What do you want? Someone asked for a child. Someone wanted a house. Someone wanted freedom from a disease. Someone wanted victory over his enemy. There was not a single person who did not have some wish. In the end, Buddha called that poor man and asked him, What do you want? He replied with folded hands, Nothing. If God has to give me something, then just do this much that no evil should ever be born in me. I consider myself the happiest by listening to him. Buddha said to Anand, Anand, where there is greed, there cannot be happiness. Anand took this teaching of Buddha to heart forever. It is that profit increases with greed, which is the cause of dissatisfaction. If there is happiness in the true sense, then instead of any greed, one should be satisfied with the available conditions. Gautam Buddha had given right view to many ignorant people. It happened then that there was a brahmachari in Kaushambi. He was proud that there was no scholar like him, so he always kept a burning torch with him. When Gautam Buddha saw him, he asked, Hey, why do you roam around with a torch? The brahmachari replied, All creatures are best in darkness and obedience. I roam around with a torch to show them the path. Tathagata asked, Do you have complete knowledge of all types of sciences, word knowledge, star knowledge, king knowledge, and war knowledge? The brahmachari, revealing his ignorance, made the torch fake and bowed his head at the feet of Tathagata. His knowledge became proud. The one who hates others thinking them to be fools is like the person who himself is blind and roams around showing torches to others. An arrogant person is never wise. It is possible and without discretion, one cannot know the difference between truth and falsehood. Ultimately, such a person without discretion does not achieve anything in life and only gets disappointment. She wore kasha clothes. She heard that you have become a hari. She too has become a hari. You have given up sleeping on a good bed, so she too has given up. 
You have given up the garland. You have given up the dirt. So she too has given up all that. Her parents send her a message. They want to take her away, but she stays here. She kept looking at the idol of the gun in the same classroom. Suddenly Tathagata got up and went out of the room. Shakya had asked the disciples to remain quiet, but he himself went out of the room. I always wonder what must have happened to her. What kind of thoughts must have arisen in her mind? Is addressing a short moment or a long moment? Is addressing an infinite practice? Is self-restraint her Garuda vehicle? The thirteenth verse of Dhammapada comes to mind again and again. Yathagaram duchen bhuti, samiti, vibhatiti, evam, abhavitam, chitam, raghav, samiti, vibhajyati. If the roof of the house is not strong and it is not covered properly with grass and straw, then in both the rains, the water from it spreads throughout the house. In this way, meditation and concentration is the roof of our personality. One day, one person becomes Buddha. On reaching Buddha, he was very tensed. Many questions were going around in his mind and troubling him, like what is soul, where does a man go after death, who is the creator of the universe, to what extent is the concept of heaven and hell true, and whether God exists or not. He was not getting answers to these questions. When he reached Buddha, he saw that many people had surrounded Buddha. Buddha was solving all their questions and deceptions very easily. This went on for a long time, but Buddha kept satisfying everyone with patience. The poor man got disturbed after seeing the condition there. He thought, what is the use of studying them about worldly matters? He should do his Bhagwat Bhajan and drive away these people suffering from basic problems. But after seeing Buddha's behavior, it seemed as if the pain of these people is his own pain. After all, the person asked him, Maharaj, what do you have to do with human body buttons? Buddha said, I am not a meditator and I am a human being. Anyway, what is the use of that knowledge which is so arrogant and self-centered that it cannot worry about anyone else except itself? Such knowledge is worse than ignorance. After listening to Buddha, the person gets rid of his confusion. Both of them change their mind from day to day. The gist of the story is that knowledge is meaningful only when it is involved in public welfare. Mahatma Buddha explained the importance of satsang to the young man. Mahatma Buddha was staying in a village. He used to do satsang there every evening. There used to be a crowd of devotees because his sermons used to give the right direction to life. There was amazing magic in Buddha's speech. Then Buddha explained to him that if you keep putting it in water like this, then in a few minutes these holes will swell and get filled and you will be able to fill the basket with water. Similarly, those who do satsang continuously, their water definitely becomes pure one day. Now the holes of the guna start getting filled and the water of the guna starts filling. The young man got a solution to his problem from Buddha. Even wicked people become good by continuous satsang because the holy speech of great men removes their mental disorders and spreads the light of good thoughts in them. Buddha suggested to a man that if water is coming from far away, why don't you dig a well near your house? You will get rid of the problem of water forever. Accepting the advice, the man dug a well. He started digging, but after digging eight feet, he did not find any water, let alone a lump of soil. He left that place and started digging at another place, but even after digging ten feet, he did not find any water. He then started digging wells at the third place, but here also he was disappointed. In this work, he dug ten cans of eight ten feet each, but did not find any water. Disappointed, he went to Buddha and told Buddha that he had dug ten wells, but did not find any water. Buddha was surprised, and he himself came to the place where he had dug ten wells. Buddha measured the depth of those wells and understood the matter. Still, he said that instead of digging ten cans, if you had put in all your effort in just one can, you would have found water long ago. You should have tied all the cans and deepened only one. Whatever water came out, he agreed to Buddha and did the same. As a result, water came out as soon as the well was completed. Everyone hailed Lord Buddha. Dana Seth had as much wealth as Palanpur Poshan of Pashto. 
his business was based on that, was spread all around. But even then, his mother was restless. Sometimes he was worried about the safety of his money, and sometimes he was under stress to get ahead in business competition. Due to worry and stress, he started remaining unwell. His friend noticed his deteriorating condition and advised him to go to Buddha. Seth went to Buddha and told him his problem. Buddha consoled him and said, Don't worry, your pain will surely go away. You just stay here for a few days and meditate on God. As per Buddha's advice, Seth started meditating daily, but Seth's mother did not concentrate on meditation. As soon as he sat down to meditate, his mother again went back to her world. He told this to Buddha, but Buddha did not suggest any solution. After some time when Seth was taking a stroll in the forest with Buddha, a thorn pricked his wing. He started screaming in pain. Buddha said, It would be better if you remove the thorn by meditating. Then you will get relief from this pain. Seth removed the thorn by meditating and got a chain. Then Buddha explained to him, Similarly the thorns of anger, pride and hatred are in your wing. Until you remove them with your determination, you will remain restless. The merchant's wisdom was dispelled by these words of Buddha, and he took the path of a pure heart. Determination is essential to get rid of one's bad tendencies. Until a person makes a firm determination, he cannot get rid of his bad habits. A young man from the village who was converted by Buddha's teachings came to Buddha and said, My village is educated. I was able to study a little by fighting with my family. I want to study further, but everyone thinks that there is a lot of money in farming and no education is required for it. The villagers also think the same. Please come to my village and spread education there. Accepting the words of Buddha, the villagers of A. Veru village welcomed Buddha and started coming to listen to his sermons every day. Whenever Buddha explained the importance of education, the villagers had a opposing opinion. One day, a woman asked about her five-year-old child, that at what age should he be educated? Then Buddha explained that you should have started his education five years ago. You should teach him what to eat, what not to eat, how to speak, etc. From the beginning, only then he will be able to take proper care of himself. All the villagers, including the woman, understood Buddha's words, and they started sending their children to school. It was the time of rains. The young man told people the technique of water harvesting. Most of them ridiculed him, but the young man kept doing his work. He had Buddha's support, so no one opposed him openly. When the fields started drying up due to severe water crisis in summer, the young man got cans dug, from which a lot of water was extracted due to the technique of water harvesting. Now the villagers had understood the importance of education. Slowly, the whole village became educated. Knowledge can be acquired at any age. This knowledge helps us to find solutions to problems that arise in life. There were two brothers in a village who were notorious for their mischief. They enjoyed troubling others. They were always busy troubling someone or the other. Along with the people of the village, their parents were also very unhappy due to their such antics. Whenever any person from the village would complain about them to their parents, they would try to reason with them a lot, but the brothers did not pay heed to them. One day, their mother went to Mahatma Buddha, who had come to the village, and requested him to fill her children with the Spirit of God by any means so that they stop being mischievous. Mahatma Buddha asked the mother to send both of them to him, one by one. The mother sent her first son to Mahatma Buddha. He went and sat beside Mahatma Buddha. Mahatma Buddha asked him, Where is God? The boy did not understand anything and did not give any answer. Then Mahatma Buddha asked the same question again in a harsh tone. The boy ran away from there in fear and reached his brother and said, Brother, do you know that God has gone and everyone is blaming us for this? The younger brother also got scared on hearing such a big deal, and from that day, both of them stopped being mischievous. The gist of the story is that when there is no way to reform through the straight path, then it is completely appropriate to take the help of the crooked path. The merchant learned from Buddha that true prosperity is a merchant who was childless and had immense wealth. 
Despite being a master, the prophet of the Seth was intact. He was very sad about not having a child, and for this reason he had taken advantage of many fakir babas and pandits, but the result was zero. Once Buddha came to the Seth city, the Seth knew about his fame, and the next day he went to meet him and told Buddha about his childlessness. Buddha placed his hand on Seth's head and gave his heartfelt blessings. After some time, the Seth got the happiness of having a child. He was filled with gratitude towards Buddha and thought how he can do a favor to Buddha. After thinking, he kept precious diamonds and jewels in a box and went to Buddha and bowed to him. The Seth said, Maharaj, due to your grace, I got to see the face of a child. I want to do something for you, so I have brought this gift. Buddha refused the diamonds and jewels as soon as he saw them. He said, money is useless for me, you keep it. When the Seth insisted more, Buddha said, I do not take donations from the poor. The astonished Seth said, but I am not poor, I have immense wealth and property. The coffers are filled with gold and silver jewels. By working day and night, I am quadrupling this wealth day and night. Then how am I poor? Then Buddha explained that it means that you are not satisfied with your present wealth, and the excess person is poor only because the true prosperity is that which is satisfied. Buddha's button opened the eyes of the merchant. Contentment is the biggest wealth, and a contented person is the richest because the end of desires leads to the ultimate blissful state of detachment. Once Prince Abhai asked Gautam Buddha whether Shravan Gautam ever speaks harsh words. He had thought that if he said no, he would tell that once he had said that Devadatta was going to hell, and if he said yes, then he could be asked that, when you cannot stop yourself from using harsh words, then how do you preach such things to others? Buddha understood the meaning of Abhai's question and said that its answer can be given either in yes or no. At that time, there was a small child in Abhai's god. Pointing towards him, Buddha asked, Prince, if this child unknowingly puts a piece of wood in his mouth, then what will you do? I will try to take it out. If it cannot come out easily, then I will hold his head with my left hand and bend the finger of my right hand to take it out. Even if blood starts coming out, my effort will be to take out that piece of wood somehow. This is because my mother has compassion towards it. Prince, in the same way, Tathagata never utters a word about which he knows that it is false or harmful, and it hurts the hearts of others. But in the same way, he always utters the words which seem true and beneficial to him, and which are liked by others. The reason for this is that the mother of Tathagata has compassion towards all living beings. Lord Buddha had scriptures of gods and humans, but first of all, he was a human. Man grows and becomes a god. This was an ancient belief. Even today we talk about divinity over humanity. But Buddha reversed this order. He said, This humanity is called attaining salvation of gods. When a god attains salvation, he becomes a human. Gods have luxury, love, hatred, jealousy, and attachment are also there. Nirvana cannot be achieved there. For this, gods have to become humans. It is in humans that the divine man appears, whom the gods salute. Buddha, who preached the religion of humanity, was himself the living embodiment of humanity. Here, incidents related to his life are given, from which one can see the deep humanity present in his personality. God is about to attain nirvana. It is late night. The monks are sitting around their master. Buddha is preaching to them. He is saying to the monks, if you have any doubts about Buddhism and Sangha, ask them. Do not regret later that God was in front of us, but we could not ask him anything. No disciple speaks. God says three times, but no monk stands up to ask anything. Bhagwan doubts whether he is hesitating to ask thinking of his pride, so he says, Maybe Bhikshus, you are not asking because of my pride, just like a friend asks a friend. Similarly, you should ask me. Buddha is aware of the role of his disciples in society. This humility of theirs is the foundation of human religion. Buddha has called himself the well-wisher of the bhikshus, which depicts their human help and humility. Another scene is also of this time. 
Buddha did his last prayer at the place of Chan Karma and Sun. After that, he got a severe disease of bleeding, which became the reason for his death. Buddha was very concerned about his heart. The devotees and worshippers could have regretted that Bhagwan left his body only after doing his prayer. So before taking his last breath, he ordered Anand to remove this worry of Chand Karma and Sun and tell Ayushman, You have earned a great profit that by eating my food, Tathagata attained Parinirvana, the one who had immense compassion in his heart. Why would he not say so? She got her husband to offer obeisance at the feet of Buddha. Bhagwan blessed her and said, Kolia daughter Supervas, she should be happy, she should be healthy, she should be happy and healthy, and without any pain, she should deliver a son. He had full sympathy with Brahmins as well, just as he had full sympathy with all the creatures of the world. When a disciple of a Brahmin named Bhavri offered obeisance at the feet of God on behalf of his guru, God blessed him and said, Bhavri Brahmin along with his disciples should be happy, human. You should also be happy. May you live long. Whoever went to Buddha, small or big, he used to say to him, Come, you are welcome. God was going to the beach of Nara on his last journey. On the way, he met a trader named Pukas Malputra. He gifted him a shawl, but how could God fly alone? He wanted to honor his disciple Anand. He said, Pukas, cover me with one part of the shawl and give the other to Anand. Pukas did the same. Buddha was compassionate even towards those who made mistakes. Once an eclipse invited God to stay in Viranja for the rainy season. God went there, but that eclipse was very heavy, and it did not take anything pure from him. Buddha suffered a lot. For a month, he had to eat pounded rice daily because there was a famine in Varanja at that time, and that too, he and his disciples got from the horse traders. Despite all this, at the end of the rainy season, Lord Buddha did not forget to go to Viranja and bless Brihan before going elsewhere. There are countless such incidents in the life of Lord Buddha. In them we get a glimpse of his humanity. There was the culmination of tenderness in his life, and there was an incomparable sweetness in his voice, which attracted everybody towards him. An angry word never came out of his mouth. He was a human being, but had risen above the weaknesses of humans. The auspiciousness of humanity was evident in his personality. The state of religion was evident 